Yo, y'all, it's your bro, Yo Elliot, back with another video, back with a so-called podcast. So I guess what makes it a podcast is that it's long form. I'm just going to be rapping to y'all over the course of who the hell knows how long, because I can go. And uh, another reason that I might be able to call this a podcast, even though it's uh, YouTube first, because that's where I'm at, that's where I've been, that's what I do, done is because uh, we're going to strip the audio from these and, uh, and we're going to upload it to, uh, you know, all the, all the, all the podcast platforms, right? So you got iTunes and then uh, Spotify and a few others. And people have been asking me to do this for a long time. And so uh, there's really nothing to it. I'm talking to cameras all day long anyway. So we're just going to strip these, throw them up on those platforms, plus a bunch of other bonus type audios we're going to put on there. Uh, I know I've made a lot of videos over the years and I've got a lot of really good stuff to say that people want to hear about. So we'll probably repurpose some old stuff, throw them on those podcast platforms. And then every once in a while, I'll do something special just for the podcast people out there. But YouTube is where it's at, where it's going to be. And it's where we're going to start this journey back to making a lot of content, expressing myself. So let me slow down here for a minute. And give you guys some context for what we're about to get into. Now, last week I turned 40 years old. And uh, as a part of my 40-year celebration, I decided to upload a video where I talked about 40 ways I was wrong as fuck. Right? So 40 things that um, I had to reevaluate over the course of the last few years in my life. And, uh, and so before making that video, I literally just... I, I was laying in my hammock after my workout, and I was like, I'm just going to write down 40 freaking things that I think people will find interesting about uh, my way of thinking on various topics. And, uh, and I just jot them, I just, I just threw them in there. There was no thought put into it. In fact, I think I do best when I'm spontaneous. The more I think, the more convoluted and weird shit gets. And I'm already a weird guy. So the more spontaneous I can keep it, the better. So I just laid there. It took me about 10 minutes, jotted them all turned on the camera, and spilled it all out to you guys. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot more that I could add to that list, and there are certain things to that list that I could probably take off. But uh, I had a fun time making that list, and I had a good time sharing it with you. And then in retrospect, you know, I act first, think later. So thinking later... Uh, I realized it'd be good for me to go into greater detail as to how I was wrong or maybe how I changed my mind or how my thoughts are evolving around certain topics. And so uh, over the course of the next 40 videos for the big 4-0, I'm going to dive deep into each one of the, uh, each one of the things I was wrong about and that I spoke about briefly in that video. Plus that video... Man, it was over an hour long, and although I can rant, uh, I'm a sprinter, <laughs> so you know I gotta I gotta get it done real quick first, uh, or just get 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 it out of my system quickly. Otherwise, things start to uh, I slow down. Like I said, I'm a sprinter, so I'm I'm good for forty yards. All right, I run four three forty four three four forty in the forty yard dash when I play college football, and um, but at, don't ask me to run a fucking mile. I'm a sprinter, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to sprint with these, but you know it's gonna be whatever it is, middle distance maybe. Um, so towards the end of that video, because it was so long, I really I wasn't able to to really give, share, elaborate, expand upon a lot of the things that I kind of just threw out there quickly. And I realize a lot of people are either, uh, you know, because of the comments that I've been getting, either misunderstood something I said. Um, some people like to miss, what's that word? Um, purposely just like hear what they want to hear. What's that word? Misrepresent, misrepresent. I see a lot of people misrepresent what I say. And, uh, and that's okay. You do whatever you want with this. I'm just spitting. You can take it however you want it. A lot of times, what we got to realize is that when we share, 
people receive in their own way. So to be sharing from the heart, I'm talking about you, talking about you when you're talking to your friends or you're making YouTube videos or you're putting something on Instagram or you're being courageous and you're putting your heart out there and people just don't fucking get it. It's okay. It is the act of creativity. It's the act of sharing. It's the act of expressing oneself. That's the real gift. I think Oscar Wilde once said that uh, the only thing that art is meant to express is itself, meaning there's no meaning. And I really, truly consider myself since the beginning as an artist, as a poet. I'm going to share something with you real quick here. See that right there? That's a picture of Ralph Waldo Emerson and a picture of me. And uh, since I was 23 years old, Ralph Waldo Emerson has been a tremendous uh, inspiration in my life. First, just from, you know, the, the incredible words of his essays. But then later on, because of how he lived his life. And if you ever get a chance to read the book or listen to the audio of uh, Mind on Fire, I think it's called. It's the, uh, it's the biography of Ralph Waldo Emerson written by a guy who, you know, went through all of his writings, all of his letters. And one of the things that amongst many that caused me to admire Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, is that although he was a brilliant man in many regards, he always considered himself a poet towards the end, you know, to the end. He was like, I'm a poet. You know, he was an orator. He was a writer. He was a speaker. Uh, he traveled the world. He, he was even a healer of sorts, you know. And, um, but he, he just, when he had to put an umbrella over everything that he did, he said, I'm a poet. And so when it comes to my content, right, I'm kind of giving you a warning here. When it comes to my content, I'm not trying to be right. I have no interest in being right. I have no interest in convincing anybody of anything. I have no interest in being understood. I have no interest in being factual, right? You know, I might say some shit. I might say some shit that's just not true. <laughs> but I don't care. It's not the point. My point is not to is is not to be right, to be factual, to be true to anything but my heart. And in the moment, I may say some things that I'll change my mind later. That's why I made this 40 ways I was wrong. And I guess I'll tell you what. 40 ways I was wrong is going to be 80 ways I was wrong when I turn 80 years old. Because I'm going to be wrong about a lot of damn things. But as my friend Emerson says, say today with as much conviction as what you said yesterday, even though what you say today completely contradicts what you said yesterday. Something to that effect. The whole idea is the intention, the passion, the conviction and the self-expression associated with being an artist, right? So don't take me seriously. Anybody who gets upset about the things I say, it's your fault. You're taking me way too seriously. People take me more seriously than I take myself. And that became a problem when I was making YouTube videos back in the day because people were taking me so seriously that I started taking myself seriously. And if you notice, early in my YouTube creation, video creation career, I kind of warned people, I, not kind of, fuck that, I did. I warned you. I said, don't take me too seriously. I quoted uh, Bruce Lee and I said, you know, look, don't look at the finger, look at the moon. You keep your eye on the finger, you're going to, or where the, where the finger's pointing, you know, it was the moon in his thing. You're going to miss all the heavenly glory. Don't look at me. Appreciate the art, you know. So people, you know, people started taking me too seriously in, in a good, and this isn't good and bad. And I began taking myself too seriously. And that's no way for an artist to be. It's no way for a poet to be. That's a way for a scientist to be, right? You guys are all fucking serious and square. That's all right. I'm on a square. I'm a spiral. Or like Alan Watts says, there's prickles and there's goo. And I'm goo. What you say to me bounces off and sticks on you. Prickle. So, you know, you guys want to be prickly, squares, square pricks, go for it. Uh, but just, you can't, you can't take me too seriously because I don't take myself too seriously. But I'm having a great time and that's really what it's all about. So uh, I'm kind of jumping all over the place. 
I have a little bit of an outline, but you know, the minute I started creating an outline, I realized real quick, that's a dumb idea, E, because that means you have an intention and you do best off the, uh, off the cuff. That's why my YouTube videos about uh, with the Q and A's we did so well, because I didn't think about those answers. You guys threw them at me and I just bounce, bounce them right back. Right. But, uh, there are a few things that I do want to get off my chest for this, uh, for this first video first podcast in what is going to be a long series a long series of series is because i'm ha- i'm gonna have a lot of fun doing this and you guys are gonna enjoy yourselves along the way also too right because it's just me here doing this and i'm the kind of guy that just thinks about myself and uh and i gotta realize i like to realize that you get to benefit too so uh let me, let me come back let me come full circle let me come back to my outline Introduction to my first show, Intention. I already spoke to you about that. Uh, I also may bring back some Q&A. And um, I'm pretty sure I will because I like doing that. So although this is my 40, my 40 Confessions uh, series, I'll probably run a few series uh, alongside this. Um, one of the things that I'm going to be doing, which is pretty damn cool, is that with each one of those 40 ways that I was wrong as fuck, I'm going to bring somebody that might be more right than me to talk a little bit about the things that I was talking about there. So, <laughs> you know, uh, another thing, another warning, I'm not an expert. I'm not trying to be an expert. Don't want to be an expert. But it's always cool when experts agree with what I say. So I'm going to bring some experts that agree with me, right? Echo chamber. I'm going to bring in my echo chamber buddies to agree with me. I think the very first guy I'm going to have on is, uh, which is tomorrow, and uh, it's going to be recorded, Paul Saladino. And he's going to talk to us about why vegetables are trash. He doesn't know that yet, but I hear what he's saying. He's a scientist, and he's not willing to say vegetables are trash, but he says it in a roundabout way. And I'm going to say, hey, Paul, tell us why vegetables are trash. I'll stop right there. (laughs) Yeah, boy. All right. So that's my warning. Just so you understand the intention of this uh, series. Warning. Don't take me too seriously. Uh, This is art. Um, EH Show Platform. So I already kind of spoke to you guys about this stuff. One thing that I would invite you to do if you're a YouTube uh, viewer, people who enjoy watching YouTube videos but you have friends or you like to do you like to listen to podcasts when you're driving or something like that go and uh, I don't even think it's set up yet but when it, when the time comes go and click the link so that you can you can listen to these on podcasts and uh, and vice versa if you're a podcaster and you happen to come across this or you're listening to this and you want to you want to see me right while I'm talking or um, you know there are times that I'm I'm using visuals or if you're just in the YouTube mood, go to YouTube and watch the video. Uh, and then finally, I'm having a lot of fun on Instagram these days expressing myself, triggering a lot of snowflakes with some of the shit that I say, my, my self-expression. And so uh, if, you wanna, if, you, if you wanna take a look at the bloodbath, go over to my Instagram at ElliotHulse.com. I'm dropping truth bombs and letting the people sort themselves out. And, uh, and I think you guys would enjoy that. If nothing else, to be entertained. Are you not entertained? Triggered. It, to be triggered is still to be entertained. And I, I had to remember that myself also, too, because there was a time when, I, again, I started taking myself too seriously. And I realized people were being triggered by the things that I was saying. So I started pulling back, not realizing, well, there, there goes the entertainment value. So be triggered, please. Let me know that you're triggered. And if you're not, if you agree with me, because there's, there's a lot of soldiers out there that agree with everything that I'm saying. And that's all right, that's cool too. That means we could be in an echo chamber together and we got the best echo chamber out there, right? There's a lot of weak echo chambers out there, right? Like, oh, let me not get started. (laughs) It'll never end. So in this episode, here's what we are gonna be talking about. Let's get down to it. The very first thing that I was wrong as fuck about during my 40 ways I was wrong as fuck video series was that I am indestructible. 
And I really and truly believed that I was indestructible for a very long time because I never, ever got injured. I was the kid, like I said, that was fearless. I remember my parents, uh, I got a phone call from uh, uh, kids, uh, a group of kids when I was maybe in like kindergarten. Uh, you know, I went out with them and th their parents were watching us. And their parents were kind of scared because I was climbing trees. I was climbing on top of playground equipment. And I was doing all kinds of crazy shit that I might get hurt. And, uh, you know, p parents today are even more scared about their kids getting hurt, especially other kids getting hurt, but you couldn't, they couldn't hold me down. And so they had to call my parents like, okay, this kid is out of control. He climbs trees. He's completely fearless. He's on top of the playground equipment, not in it, not on it, on top of it. And so my parents always laugh about that. They're like, yeah, those people didn't know how the hell to deal with you. My parents said it was fine because my dad grew up in the jungle. He's, my dad's a fearless dude. My mom's a courageous woman. So, uh, you know, they got courageous kids. And I really and truly believed that I was uh, uh, invincible. And it was a great gift. Let me talk about the gifts of the attitude of being invincible before I move on. Because I'm going to talk about my wounds. I'm going to talk about all my injuries in a moment. And I'm going to relate them to Iron John, uh, uh, Robert Bly's concept, his uh, assertion that every wound is a wound. And uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to look at your wounds and, uh, and see how they have been helpful to you. What the hell was I going to talk about? Being invincible. Oh, how, how wonderful it is to think that you're invincible. Yeah, th there's a gift there also, too. And I want to kind of relate it because it's a mindset. To be invincible is, um, is something that you can, I really and truly believe that you can develop as a, as a mindset, as a paradigm, as a way of living, as a practice, as a praxis, something that you can do every day in a little, bit, in a, in a little way to kind of get out of your own way so that you can be the hero of the day, so that you can be invincible. So, um, you know, being invincible, having the mindset of thinking that you're invincible allows you to excel in sports. That's one thing that I recognize very quickly. I was never considered, I never considered getting hurt. If you play sports, if you play any game, if you do anything with your body and you think that you're going to get hurt. I train so many guys in the gym and a lot of people that watch my videos have come here because they train in the gym, but they've got this timid fucking mindset. That, oh, I got to be careful that I don't injure. People who used to say that to me when I was a trainer, like, because there was a time when I was really, I was pushing people. I push people because I push myself. You know, I don't subject people to anything that I wouldn't subject myself to. And I remember even like some of the parents, maybe I'm a bad guy. Maybe I am. But I remember some of the parents asking, Elliot, are you sure this is safe? You know, I'd have kids flipping tires and lifting, lifting stones. Elliot, are you sure this is safe? I, I would hate for my son to injure himself. And immediately, I would feel my the fire in my solar plexus. I just wanted to go, Rah! like, stop being a pussy. And you're making your son a pussy, too, just by thinking about that. Your thoughts around being getting injured are slowly sinking into your son's consciousness. You know, so you, there. I guess there's a fine line between... Uh, being safe, secure, prudent, and balls to the wall, courageous, strong, brave, manly, that you ought to consider, right? And, and look, it's for each and every one of us to sort of navigate that gray area on your own, but I lean towards recklessness. It's just my nature. So uh, with that kind of an attitude, I excelled in sports constantly, always. No matter what it was that I was doing, be it, you know, I think in order to be able to sprint really fast, I was always a fast kid, you got to go with reckless abandon. Reckless abandon. That means your legs are, are spinning like, uh, like in the cartoons when they would just zoom, right? Reckless abandon, no thought whatsoever. I think the big... One of the things that causes people to hesitate in their courage is their overthinking. So you got to stop thinking. The other, the other way that I saw this manifest itself in sports, this, this, this recklessness, I'll even say, 
you know, invincibility, but I'm going to say recklessness. I kind of like that word also too. I really like that word. I've, I've learned how to, I've learned how to hone that in a little bit. And I've had my experiences, injuries, we'll talk about in a moment, that have caused me to be a little bit more humble. But I'll still carry that as a banner. Reckless motherfucker. I'm reckless. So one of the way, another one of the ways that um, that sense of recklessness has been of great value uh, was when I played football. Right? When you play football, here was, because <laughs> I, I recognize how, very early on I recognize how weak most people's mindsets are. It, did, it, it didn't take very long. Weak their how weak their minds and bodies are. You know, I gotta say, I was a gifted kid. I guess you know, not in, not in academics. They told me I, I had learning disabilities, but gifted in uh, athletics, and um, and so one of the ways that I recognized that I could dominate everybody on the football field was with my mindset. And uh, I very quickly discovered that uh, the the first person, you know, so if I remember being in middle school. And uh, I was I was one of the smallest. And I was definitely the youngest because there was you know I was in seventh grade and then there was eighth grade and ninth graders. Um, <laughs> and then they would do this. They, we would do this uh, exercise, right? I forget what we call this drill, where one person would be in the middle, right? Only boys would do shit like this. I don't even know. I, I doubt they even still do this. Let me know if you guys play football. I, I forget what it's called, but it's like kind of like a wheelhouse, you know, going around the wheel. And um, there'd be one guy in the middle. And you, you got to chop your feet, chopping your feet. And uh, as you're there, you got to maintain your peripheral vision because the coach will call out somebody in the circle to come at you. And you got to like either defend yourself or, you know, something like that. But you got to hit each other. Bang! That's what you're doing. And uh, during that drill, I, I recognized very quickly as a as a 12 year old that the First man to flinch is the one that's going to get fucked up. Don't flinch. So I would just be chopping, chopping, chopping. Here comes the guy. I'm making eye contact. Yeah! I didn't want to hit him. I wanted to go through him. I was trying to kill people. That's the kind of mindset I have, you know. Call me violent. Call me bad. Call me evil. I'm trying to kill motherfuckers when I put that helmet on. That was it. That, that was my, my M.O. And I think that if more young men had opportunities to express themselves in that way, I think my camera's getting a little blurry, uh, that, they, that, that maybe there would be less real violence in the world, right? Because when a young man starts having that surge of testosterone, starts feeling himself, starts building a little muscle, and he needs a place to direct that energy. And... If he doesn't have, I really truly believe a violent sport, some, something that forces you to challenge yourself, maybe not violent, but even weightlifting, but not bodybuilding, like powerlifting or strongman, something where you got to be fucking violent. Like my strongman coach used to say, rip that stone off the ground violently. He said, be violent with the stone. You got there, you got to express that violence because otherwise it grows perverted pathological on the inside and then you start spilling it out all over the place doing weird things right this is you know when i say perverted i mean i literally mean that right if you don't have a place to put that vital energy it's going to show up in perversions i'll leave it that way i'll just leave it there but it, it, it doesn't go away that's the whole thing so mommies trying to save your boys First of all, when your boy turns 13 years old, mommy needs to get the fuck out of the way. And, uh, and you know, you need, you need male mentors at that point. 13, 14 years old, mommy needs to get out of the way. If your mommy is still trying to protect you when you're 13, 14 years old, uh, run away. Close your ears. <laughs> I, don't see, I don't see you. I don't hear you. Plug your ears. Close your eyes. And run away. Because mommy's trying to keep you weak. That's what mommies do. It's Okay. You know, they're nurturers and they got you here and they love you more than anybody or anything in the world. But that's the problem. That's where it grows pathological. So you got to get the fuck away from mommy and go do something dangerous. So there's a lot of good to be had with that kind of attitude. Um, granted that it's projected in the right direction. 
before I move on to my list of injuries and kind of get into this conversation with you guys about how your wounds are a wound, and uh, it doesn't matter if it's a if it's a psychological, emotional, physical wound. There's an opportunity for you to transmutate that. There's an opportunity for you to take that and and uh, and allow it to teach you how to be a stronger version of yourself in a myriad of different ways. It's magical. It's called alchemy, right? There's nothing. Alchemy is about turning base metal into gold. There's nothing that you can't alchemize in your life. There's nothing that you can't take from base metal and turn it into gold. But it has everything to do with your attitude, your mindset. You know, you have to have a winner's mindset, meaning no matter how much I get knocked down, I'm still going to win, right? But if you've got that loser's mindset, that means you're a victim and you can't win. You can't win. You cannot win if you have a victim mentality. Because when you have a victim mentality, you are winning in the victim realm, right? You got to understand that too. That there's a benefit to being a victim. You might think, oh, woe is me when you're a victim, but there's a benefit to being a victim. There's something that you get out of that. I know many, many, many victims out there that became victims because their mommies liked with them when they were victims, right? When you're, think about when you were a kid. This is how the victim mentality begins. When you're a kid and you get a snotty nose or you scrape your knee and mommy runs to the rescue, you realize real quickly, oh, I just won. The manipulation game. I get sympathy. Mommy comes and cuddles me. And, uh, you know, that kind of behavior, that kind of paradigm, that kind of attitude carries through into your, into your adult life. So if you walk around thinking of yourself as a victim all the time, woe is me telling people your fucking problems, which nobody cares, it's because you're waiting for mommy to come and kiss your boo boo. Just know that. Understand that. No judgment. Just be aware of it so you can stop. totally keep notes because I, I keep losing my track here. Oh, yeah. We got some time. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to I'm just going to keep going until I <laughs> until I fade. So there is a there's a story. That I, that I really want to share with you guys in the same way that I made that uh, thus spake Varasutra. Zarathustra uh, video that you know that so many people love from Nietzsche. It was the one about the lion becoming a lion, right? Starting out as the as the beast of burden, going into the into the uh, desert as a camel, becoming a lion. After you become a lion, or you become a lion by killing the dragon. You guys know the one. If you don't know the one, go look it up. Uh, I'd like to actually do that one over again because there's a piece of that that I think a lot of people missed. You know, very briefly, uh, the story is about the hero's journey, and it was it's related by it's uh, I, I reference Frederick Nietzsche, and very briefly he talks about you know being a beast of burden as a as a youth, you know carrying the weight of the world. Everybody tells you what to do. You should do this. Don't do that. Uh, going out into the desert where you're by yourself, facing the dragon called called Thou shalt. And thou shalt is basically all that shit that you're carrying on your back. Overcoming thou shalt, the camel beats the dragon, becomes a lion. You know, everybody loves this part. He becomes a lion. Become a lion in your life. That's the climax. But but I don't remember if I even mentioned it in that video because I was still climaxing. <laughs> and uh, and everybody loves it. I've heard some renditions of it. You know, people have like turned it into remixes. And they stop right there at the lion. Do you know what happens after you become a lion, right? If you follow that, if you follow that story. You know what happens after the lion? What does? What do you think the lion becomes? What do you think the lion? He peaked. The lion becomes a baby. And I could tell you, I know what that's like. In fact, it relates directly to a lot of what we're going to be talking about in this in this lesson, in this podcast in this video uh it's about coming full circle and starting all over again like yesterday was easter you know and, and easter is about babiness it's about being reborn resurrection and so you know there's a climax there's a death and then there's a rebirth and so no matter how much of a lion you become the next step is baby start from scratch 
And it's not just any baby, it's a wiser baby. It's a brilliant baby. It's a baby with wisdom, not a dumb baby, but a bright baby. And so you become a brighter baby each time. So anyway, the reason why I brought that up is because um, there's another story that just is that impactful, has been that impactful to me. And I think if I just focus, what I'll do is I'll focus one video on it. And it's about, it's about that attitude of being indestructible. And, um, and I'm looking at it right now. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my time later. I'll read it. I'll get it in my mind. And then I'll relate it to you in that dramatic fashion I did with the other one. Um, I'm not even going to tell you the name of it because you're going to go look it up. But, but, but just look forward to that, folks. That's just a preview. I'm just giving you a, I'm giving you a uh, foreshadowing for some cool shit that's coming soon. And I've got another really amazing story, old ancient story, uh, not just about the hero's journey, that Nietzsche was about the journey, but about the attitude of the winner in that journey. A winning attitude. Nothing can take me down. Strongest weapon is on the inside, baby. So, let's get into this. I'd like you to take some time and consider for yourself, while I'm going through this list for myself, of wounds. You know, when I say wounds, I mean like, Either you came into this world a little different, right? Maybe you got cerebral palsy, right? Or maybe uh, maybe you're blind, blind in one eye, right? Maybe you got one leg shorter than the other. Um, you know, all kinds of things. Things that, that, that you're born with and things that happen upon you that are completely out of your control, right? Like... Uh, and, you know, some of them are, are, are really tough, right? Like some, like maybe you get into a car accident and now you're paralyzed from your waist down, right? I'm not making light of any of this, by the way. I, I just, I speak in a, flip, in a flippant way because, um, you know, it's not about taking ourselves too seriously either. But, uh, you know, you get into a car accident you, and you lose, lose both legs. Or your family gets into a car accident and you lose them. And you're left alone. I mean, that's a wound also too, right? So that wound to the to the spinal cord takes your physical roots. But then, you know, the wound to your family tree destroys some, uh, like, family roots. And so it could be anything, these wounds. They don't have to be physical. They can be uh, experienced in your world, in your, in your metaphysical life, you know. Um, boy. A uh, an abusive parent, an alcoholic parent, um, abuse. Um, I mean, the list goes on. It, it's absolutely anything. When I'm talking in terms of injuries, wounds, wounds, wounds to the soul, wounds to the body, wounds to the mind, emotional wounds. And they we some of sometimes we come in here with them, and sometimes uh, they show up. Cancer, right? diabetes, all these things, they show up. And again, like I said earlier, we can, we can see them as means for taking the low road, the depressed road, or we can allow them to help us grow wings and we can take the high road. And it doesn't matter what the wound is, they're always a womb. And this is the way uh, Robert Moore describes it in Iron John, a uh, book for men. Every man should read this book. Better yet, listen to it on Audible. And um, and when he says that, images come to my mind of a, of a womb where a baby's being grown, right? And if you think about a wound and it being a womb, there's something now that can grow inside you. There's a new life inside you that wants to come out. And if you could look at particularly tragedies, you know, tragic injuries, things that were just freak that just happened. Uh, it's almost like you just receive some seeds from God, from the almighty. Right. And it's kind of like uh, the, the wound is feminine. 
And that's because you receive it, right? The feminine is, is receptive. And if you get a wound, you receive that wound. You didn't go conquer the wound. You didn't go get the wound, right? You receive the wound. And that is very feminine and it's very uh, humbling. And when you receive a wound that becomes a womb, well, it's like you, like God ejaculated into you, right? And when you think about when you think about ejaculation, right? I'm talking about literal ejaculation, sperm and shit. Uh, there's a there's a term people use often called essence. That's the man's essence. Have you ever heard that? You ever heard that that a man's Sperm is his essence. So there's something of the essence of God that wants to be born in you. And when I talk about the essence of God, I'm talking about the Imago Dei, right? Is that the right term? The, the, the image of God in you. Each one of us have a unique fingerprint, right? We know this physically. Physically, we know that we're all unique. You're a snowflake. You are. You got a unique uh, fingerprint. Everybody's phys phys physical is, is unique. But your soul and your soul's path on this planet, your life, no one will ever live a life like yours. And oftentimes these wounds come because we're not living our soul's path. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So they're course corrections, right? So when God offers a wound so that he can inject you with his essence, your capital S, self-essence, what he's kind of asking you to do is stop trying to be somebody else. Stop trying to measure up to somebody else's fingerprint and live your fingerprint, right? And I'm talking about acute wounds, right? You know, because there are different ways to look at it. I can just speak for the acute wounds that I've experienced and, um, and how it's it's offered me this in my life. But each one is has been like God slapping me in my head and saying, live your fucking essence, E. Why are you bow down, uh, kowtowing, bowing down, being something that you're not? Be you. Regardless of the distractions in the world without being diminished by other people's opinions, judgments their fears, hopes, dreams, limitations, ambitions, right? The world around is a distraction. Now, of course, it offers boundaries so that we can navigate this place without getting too fucked up, but you got to live your essence. And if you don't live your essence, you're going to get smacked upside your head. You're going to get a wound and God's going to, is going to juke you, right? <laughs> right? It's like you're in prison. You're in that prison and God is that big old bubba who's going to give you what you came to get. I'm going to stop right there. So receive it and let it grow and live your essence. So in the recent years, mostly, uh, you know, from 2010 until, you know, we're, boy, time flies. We're, we're approaching 2020, 2019 right now. This past 10 years about, um, I've sustained more injuries than ever before in my life. And, uh, and my life has been more expanded in these 10 years than ever before in my life. Meaning, uh, so much more has happened in my life as it relates to my relationship to the world, right? I became YouTube famous, right? I'm not the most famous. I'm not Hollywood fucking famous. But there are millions of young men worldwide that know who I am. And I didn't figure that out until I started traveling outside my sleepy little city, of St. Pete. And people are like impressed. So I didn't, you know, I wasn't prepared for this. People who grew up in Hollywood or people go to L.A. because they want to become somebody. A little different. Kind of slapped me upside my head. I didn't realize. I just make these fucking videos. And then it was like magic. There was no YouTube. I just started, I started making YouTube videos when YouTube came out. So around that time, I had to go through a, a myriad of seasons of transmutation, right? And if you just watch my YouTube videos, you'll see that. I've been many different people over just a short period of time, right? 
I have no, and I'm, it's because a part of it's because I'm not afraid to evolve. I'm not afraid to change. I'm spontaneous. I'm creative. Right. And uh, along that along that route, along that route, I had many course corrections, and they came in the form of physical injuries. Now, uh, I learned through my body. I my uh, I mentioned earlier that my sense of self esteem has grown because of my strength as a kid. Um, as a football player, as a professional strongman, I became a strong, pro strongman before I was YouTube famous and, uh, and all these things. And so if God wants to get to me, he's got to beat my body up. And in 2009, 2009, I sustained my first really bad injury, which was tearing my left bicep. And... I knew in the moment that that bicep tendon tore that there was a death. And I relate this in a blog post when it, when it happened many years ago. But um, it was the first time that my children saw me cry. Right? And here I was. Here I was like 240 pounds. You know, I'm, I'm 175 right now. 240 pounds. This was when I was uh, playing around with... Uh, with the hormones, you know, with the supplements, they might say, you know, and uh, and although it had only been a short time, you know, I think I had only used it for maybe about uh, six months. <laughs> uh, it it, it kind of like accelerated God's big slapping hand across my head. It was like, OK, you th see, in my mind, in my ego, I was just going to keep winning at strong, man. You got to see, you got to understand this was my mindset. I had my family and I had my gym. And I had strong man and all of my passion, all of my energy, all of my ambition, even to the degree that I was willing to use steroids were all going towards strong man. I was going to win, win, win. You see, I got that trophy right there. I won and I want to keep winning, 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 winning. And so uh, apparently it wasn't the path for me and I was pushing. I got the big slap upside my head, tore my right, tore my left bicep and like, it didn't take too long for me to know. Almost instantly, I was like, okay, I'll stop. I'm done. I'm done. Okay, I get it. And uh, so, of course, you know, I stopped. I stopped strongman at that time. That's when I, I, I quit strongman at the peak of my strongman career. <laughs> you see, there's a pattern here for how he does things in his life or how God expresses himself through me. Because I truly believe that's the way it is. I peak. And then I'm done, right? Same thing with like YouTube, but we'll get there. We'll get there, right? So I uh, tore my left bicep and it's funny because I really and truly believed that I was going to be a pro strongman for, you know, like the next 10 years. I even had visions of being in world's strongest man, you know, mind you, I'm about, and I have always been about five inches too short to be a pro anything, unless I was, it was like a jockey. I'm five, and by the way, for those who are curious, I'm I'm five nine, five eight and a half nine, somewhere in between there, five nine. So I'm kind of average height, but you know, pro strongman, pro football player would have really required that I need, have a few more inches on me. But it, it, to me, I don't care. It didn't matter. I was going for it. But interestingly enough, it was right when I tore that left bicep, and I was like, okay, done. Okay, God, I'm done. I won't do. It. I'm done. I'm not doing this. I know I'm not supposed to be doing this. Uh that I really started to accelerate my my uh, momentum in business, and that's when I I began writing ebooks, and I wrote the Manifesto of Strength. So check this out. You know, many of you guys know me because of strength training, but it was because of that left bicep tear that I started speaking about wisdom. So this was an ebook I wrote that was called that was about uh, I think back then I called it the nine. It was called the Manifesto of Strength. I think I had nine principles of strength and wisdom. So it gave me the impetus to begin speaking to the world in terms of wisdom, wisdom philosophy, living philosophy, being the poet, being the Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, rather than just the meathead, which, you know, it was easy. It came easy to me to be, to be meathead, and it was going really well. Um, but I knew at that moment, I knew instantly that God called me to far more. He wanted me to share a whole lot more than just how to fucking deadlift. That's why all you meatheads, all you knuckleheads, 
All you knuckle draggers out there who say, why doesn't this guy just stick to lifting? That's because that's a reflection of your dumb consciousness. That's all you got. That's all you got. That's where you're at. So you want to keep me in your box, but you can't do that. I don't stay in boxes, especially boxes that other people make for me. You want me to resist? Give me a box. I'll fight you tooth and nail, even if there's $100 in that box. I ain't getting in because you told me to. Fuck you. So, uh, yeah, it's, it was, it's never been my soul's calling to just keep talking about lifting. There are guys that do that. That's okay. That's them. Right? But that, that, that's not why I was put here. That's not what I'm about. So anybody who's ever confused about why I'm talking about all these various different things, it's because that's why I'm here. This is what I do. It's who I am. It's how I express myself. And so, you know, if you like lifting, yeah, there's a ton of videos. I was a pro fucking strong man. What else can I do? I made thousands, literally thousands of videos about how to lift. Not only did I give you the best knowledge on biomechanics and how to lift. Oh, yeah, I did. Now, there are guys that are doing it now. A lot of them I look at and I'm like, I'm thinking they probably learned that by watching my videos 10 years ago. But that's neither here nor there. I'm a spark. I'm the start. I get things going. And it's not my place to finish them. So I'm, I'm proud of all those guys that are making all those videos that sound a lot like me. But um, when I'm done, I'm done. And so, you know, I made all those, I made thousands of fucking videos. What, what, do, you, what do you want me to do? You want me to make the same video again? You want me to say it over again? I can't do it. I spit and then I'm done. I'm a mic dropper. And so I dropped the fucking mic. Right? That's like somebody dropped the mic and you say, and you, you pick up the mic and you run after him like, oh, wait a second. No. All right. So um, I tore my I tore that left bicep, and that's when um, I I became very holistic in my message and started making YouTube videos. Um, and that's the the gift in that the reborn the you could I, it's inherent in the story, but I was reborn through that. It was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. That's this bicep here. Boom. And that bicep was healed pretty well. I didn't even have insurance back then. I had no health insurance. I had, I had to figure out a way. My wife, like, uh, she went through lengths, filling out all kinds of forms and, you know, petitioning all kinds of stuff to get this for me. I got a great wife. So, so um, yeah, I didn't have any insurance. That's where I was at in my life. I had a family. I had no fucking health insurance because I'm courageous. All you guys out there, I hear you. I see you, you know. I can't quit my job and start my own thing because I need health insurance. I'm going to slap them upside their head. And if they whine because their wife uh, is not about it, then you got the wrong kind of fucking woman. You got to be stronger than your woman's fears, bitches. Right? If you, live your wife, if you live your life based on your wife's fears, you're not a man. Your, your courage, your conviction... And your ability to produce has to be stronger than your wife's fears. Otherwise, she won't trust you. He can't trust you. So whenever I said something like, hey, baby, we're going to do this. And uh, it's going to be a little bit of a struggle. It's going to be a little bit of a challenge. We're not going to have health insurance for a while. She trusted me. She knew me. She was willing. But you know why? Because I deliver. That's the other thing. If you can't deliver, then there's a good reason why she don't trust you. Moving on. So, uh... It was amazing because that left bicep tear uh, turned into and created the momentum for me to become Yo Elliot. So uh, when I started making the Yo Elliot videos, it was it was post straw man. I tore my left bicep and I went through a physical transfer trans uh, transmutation. And if you look at my videos prior to 2010, so I'm thinking like 2008, uh, I was huge. I was just a different kind of person. I was this guy. Wait. There it is. That guy. I was that guy. I was that guy. I was that guy. Um you'll see. And I and then so that's when I became Yo Elliot. And I was taking my shirt off. I was looking fucking sexy in the videos. I was being entertaining with my language. I turned it I, I turned on a whole new game. And guess what? You know, I won straw man, I got all the trophies, and then I won YouTube. Because I knew that it was what I was gonna do next. I put all my eggs in that basket. 
Right? Put all my fucking eggs in that basket. Got to a million. And you know what I did? I dropped the fucking mic. And that there's a lot more to that story than that also, too. But I'm going to stick to my to my physical injuries that were associated with that. Um, because <laughs> there were some soul wounds going on there also that I needed to deal with, some inner beta stuff that I needed to deal with. Uh, and um, uh, maybe I'll talk about that in another video. But let's talk about the mic drop for when I stopped making YouTube videos. Because, you know, I say mic drop, but like it was more like the mic was pried out of my hands. And this is when a lot of the injuries started you know, the, the majority of the injuries I started having began happening. And the very first injury, it's so poetic. The very first injury was an injury to my fifth chakra, my neck. I was uh, jumping on a trampoline and I fell on my fucking head. And so as you know, I'm a fan of <laughs> the chakra system. You see these colors here? You know, and you know, there are those of you who will say, oh, that's not scientific. Um, but it is. It's actually very scientific. Um, just because it uses colors and it recognizes frequencies and sounds doesn't mean that those nerve vortexes aren't there, those nerve ganglia aren't there. doesn't mean that it's not all connected to the central nervous system and then branches out into various uh, uh, segments of the body. And the body and the brain is all one thing. The body and the, is the mind. So, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to try to convince anybody. But the fifth chakra, that, this blue area up here, let me get this right. This blue area up here, right? right I'm gonna stop. Um, is associated with communication, All right? So when you when you have a neck, ear, jaw, upper shoulder injury, there is some communication issues going on. Either you're saying you're talking too much and you're not listening, which is probably the case for me. I was not. I was not listening. I was talking too much because I became. Uh, very excited about myself because everybody else was excited about me. So I wouldn't shut up. I wouldn't stop. I just kept going. So when there's an injury there, it's it's basically telling you to slow down. Shut up. Shut up. And so uh, when God dropped me on my head and injured my fifth chakra, that it was in that moment that I didn't decide like with the bicep that I was going to go on a different road. It was at that moment that I just got shut up. And I remember going back to making videos the following week because I had not stopped making videos and I was having the hard hardest time just spitting words out. I was like, I, 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 I didn't know what to say. I was getting very, uh, I was very stifled in my self-expression and that led to all kinds of frustration and, uh, and it was, a, it was a downward spiral from there. Uh, after that, so God took away my voice. He's like, all right, stop making. So I was like, all right, I'm going to stop making you Yo Elliot videos, you know, because really I was being asked to stop completely so that I could listen. But uh, I just kind of like took the hit and kept and kept going, you know, like a warrior. Yeah, I took the bullet and I was like, I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. And so I kept going <laughs> and God is like, OK, cool, motherfucker. You want to keep going? Take this. And then that's when he started destroying my body. Um, I had, some of you guys might remember, a, a hernia repaired in my belly. Um, that's significant. You know, I always had that little, her a little hernia there. I was kind of actually born with it, or I got it when I was a baby. And um, it started getting really bad. It started, like, opening up. And I have different, that, that's, fifth, that's third chakra stuff. Willfulness. So it's almost like my, you know, my, I was overly willful. So that's third chakra, yellow in that, in that rainbow over there. Um, so I started expanding and that looked like this hernia above my belly button beginning to open and I had to have it stitched. And it's significant because, you know, here I am uh, gaining popularity because of my aesthetics. You know, I take my shirt off. I look like a beast. And now I have this... It, or then, it doesn't look so bad now, but then I had this big scar on my belly and, and it looked bad. But I kept going. And although the spiral was going downward, you know, there were a couple other things like I chipped my tooth. I then tore my right bicep. And that was kind of like the nail in the coffin. And this it happened 
One day, I mean, I was I was still kind of making videos. It was around that time that I released the King book. And, you know, there, there's never a king without a sacrifice. And it's almost like, you know, tore both biceps. It's like, yeah, you're a fucking king because you just got sacrificed. And that was kind of like the nail in the coffin when it came to, okay, I got to stop. And I really, I really stopped a lot at that time. I really had to go inward and I was completely ashamed embarrassed about the way my bicep looked now so this is this one here because it did it, the, the guy who repaired it was a slap dick and he did a shitty job in my opinion but it could just be that's the way it was supposed to be for me and uh and so it's shorter boom look at it there boom so it still works but it's it's not what it once was and so at that point i was like i can't i was too ashamed i could not show up on camera i was like what am I going to do? I, I look terrible. That's when I, you know, stopped lifting. I went into doing yoga. I was like, I got to heal my body. And I still wasn't done. 2016. And right when I started making videos again, it's like, it's almost like the guy kept saying, shut up, shut up, shut up. You won't shut up. And he kept slapping me. And the, the, the final slap, this is really when I took the longest hiatus. Uh, was like 2000, the end of 2016, I tore my Achilles tendon. So here it is. I, I'm, I'm all crippled and fucked up looking from the top up and now I'm hobbling around. And so all of this was alchemy work. It was all digestion work. I was in the belly of the bees getting worked on so that I could be healed. I say the body is the mind. And so let me tell you how I sort of reframe this all this slew of injuries these woundedness this reminder that you're not invincible how i reframe it into uh i make i i, I alchemize it you see reframe is one way to look at it and to think about it but it's really that's really square really prickly to alchemize to alchemize to alchemize is physical and metaphysical it's more metaphysical than physical because it has everything to do with mindset. That's the, that's the secret to alchemy is the way you think about things. It's your mindset. It's not about literally turning stone into gold. It's about evolving yourself through your thoughts. And so the, all these injuries, uh, I see them in the same light that I received the story of Jonah in the whale in the Bible, and all religions, all traditions, all mythologies uh, offer something very nourishing to the soul when taken in appropriately. And when I say take it in appropriately, I mean, do you have any resistance against religion or the Bible, either because you take it way too seriously, and that's a form of resistance, meaning you're always trying to prove it, prove it to people, it's true! Uh, or if you completely turn your ears off, like when I say God, I know there are a lot of you guys right there that are like, when I say God, or I mention the Bible, or I mention these, um, you know, metaphysical stories and stuff like that, you squirm in your seat. Good. I want you to fucking squirm because it points out exactly where your shadows are. You've got to be able to take these things in and use them for what they're worth, which is soul food. And so, uh, the story of Jonah and the whale, which comes from a book of soul food called the Bible. Uh, talks about a talks about a man, Jonah. He's the man in his city. I mean, Jonah is loved by everybody. He's adored by everybody. He's doing real well in business. The guy is so wise that people come to him and ask him for advice. Reminds you of somebody. And so, you know, wherever he goes, Jonah's the man. Until one day, God taps him on his shoulder. And that always looks like something different for everybody else. For me, it's the physical body. When God wants my attention, you know, he tells me through my body. Um, taps him on the shoulder and says, hey, Jonah, I need you to uh, take a break for a while and I need you to give up some of all this great stuff that's going on for you in your life right now. And I need you to go on this mission for me. I need you to to fulfill this mission for me. And it was, some, it was like some shit. I know what it is, but I'm just going to tell you guys the brief story. 
Uh, but it was some shit he didn't want to do. <laughs> he guys asked him to do some shit. He was like, uh, uh, nah, I don't want to do that. I like my life too much. And so, uh, what happens is he ends up on a, on a, on a ship some, some days with his buddies or whatever. He's on a ship and a storm comes and the storm comes and knocks him off the boat. And he ends up down in the water, down in the ocean. Water always represents the unconscious, uh, the place of receptivity. That's why water is associated with femininity, receptivity, unconsciousness, dark, suffocating. Um, there's, there's more to it than that. But not only does he end up in the water, he ends up in the belly of a whale. A whale <laughs> swallows him up. Now, it's not, it may or may not be a literal whale. That's not the point. The point is, think mythologically, think psychologically. What happens in the belly of a fucking beast? Things are being broken down, digested, assimilated, purged, refined, right? Because all the things that are good get uptaken into the organism and all the shit, all the trash, all the useless stuff purges out. So this sort of uh, cocoon of digestion is a metaphor for God working on Jonah. Like, okay, dude, you're not going to live your imago day. You're not going to live your pattern. You're not going to live your true fingerprint here. You're not going to live your, your, your fingerprint because you're too busy with everybody else's idea of what your fingerprint's supposed to look like. Well, I got I to gotta course correct you. So he puts him in the belly of this fucking beast. And he works on him. So I don't know. I forget how many days he stayed in there. But he stayed in there for a while. Down underwater in the belly of a beast. You could also think, you know, in terms of, of a beast or a whale. But a beast, a big animal. There's a lot of primal stuff going on there. A lot of instinctual stuff going on there. Uh, karma going on there. You know, uh, the, the, the beastly nature is associated with our balls our animal, the animal part of us, you know, which is our lower consciousness. So there's a lot of lower consciousness stuff going on there, right? Fears and, uh, and you know, all kinds of dreams and attachments. So he was worked on. And uh, so I think of, you know, this, this season of injuries for me as being in the belly of the beast, being the belly of the whale, God working on me. And so at some point, the, the whale did whatever it needed to do and spit him back out and he ended up <laughs> washed up on shore and he goes back to the city. But he's not the same Jonah. When he gets out of that belly's whale, the whale's belly, he's not the same Jonah and he goes and he gleefully takes on God's mission. He's like, okay, I'm, I'm ready. I'm willing. I'm able. I'm going to do it. And he goes out there and he, I think it's called Niv Nin Nineveh was the name of the city that he was in. He was supposed to warn the people to get their shit together. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. He was, he was, he, that was what God asked him to do. He said, you need to speak up and get, tell these people to get their shit together. That's basically what it is. And he couldn't, he couldn't do that until God worked on him. And that's so funny. Yeah, I just figured out something new about that story. That's what God did to me. Because there's a whole lot of shit that I was supposed to be saying that I didn't want to say because I didn't want to ruffle any feathers. I didn't want to, I don't want people to get their panties in a bunch because I was too busy being liked. And uh, now, <laughs> now I'm ready. That's why I'm busy triggering people and shit, saying all kinds of things. I'm just practicing, really. You know, some of the things that I say, like I put up that post yesterday on Instagram. Uh, go on my Instagram and see some of the shit that I put. I'm not even going to tell you. I want you to go over there and feel it in your own belly. Um, I'm just practicing. I'm just, I'm just feeling you guys out because I'm about to come with a lot of whole, whole lot of heavy shit that's gonna ruffle some feathers, right? I just, and really what it boils down to it, what God was telling Jonah and what God is telling me is, yo, E, just be you. And that means you're gonna piss a lot of people off. I'm gonna piss a lot of people off. And Jonah, when he came back, he had, he had to have a big mouth. He's like, look, you guys are living wrong, you know? Y'all are living wrong. I'm telling you right now, I'm being Jonah right now in Nineveh. Nineveh. Y'all are fucking Nineveh. I'm telling you right now, most of y'all are living fucking wrong. That's why I'm saying shit like premarital sex isn't a good idea. 
I wasn't able to say that before. I had to understand certain things in my own history and my own life also too. But, you know, that's one of those things that ruffle people be- feather, ruffle the feathers, right? Uh, and, and there are several others, right? Like, I love America. And I think Donald Trump is a great patriarch for this country, right? That's gonna, that ruffles a lot of feathers because everybody's brainwashed by the left, this fucking media. And like, I, I can't stand by any longer. I can't not say something, right? That doesn't mean that I love him and everything that he's done and stands for, but he's the archetype of masculine strength coming back to this planet, coming back to this country. That's another thing that, you know, I'd be talking about to make a lot of people upset. This different, this, this differentiation and boundary setting between the masculine and the feminine, right? That pisses a lot of fucking people off because women have been brainwashed to believe that they need to compete with men and that they could do anything a man can do when it's wrong. It's not true. Y'all, men are the stronger sex. There's no question about it. The body is the mind. So what shows up physically is a mere reflection of the metaphysical. That's why we lead men. But, you know, that, that was common knowledge for a long time. And I'm not talking about domination. I'm talking about leadership, not domination. I'm not talking about domination. I'm talking about leadership. Men are the leaders. So all these women who are, you know, super feminists, uh, They're wrong. They're very wrong. And the men who white knight and virtue signal, these are new terms I've learned, to, to, you know, and they'll attack me. Like, how dare you say that about a woman? There's this one dude, a couple strong men. It's so funny. The strong men that used to compete with me or know me are the biggest fucking pussies because I put up stuff and they're the ones that rant and talk about me the most. Well, if you got to talk about people negatively, on social media because they trigger you, that is a sign that you're a woman right there also. Like you you don't have enough going on in your own life that you that that you you you, you don't go and you're gonna start whining about what somebody said. <laughs> so I know it has a lot to do with them being jealous that they're not as strong in the soul as I am, right? No matter how much they you know bench press or whatever the case may be, they're they're women. But anyways, this kind of language that um that God wanted me to be using with y'all, just like Jonah. And, uh, and and Jonah came back with a big mouth and people got their shit straight. And, uh, and that's what this is about. That's what this whole series is about. That's what me coming back to YouTube, making these videos and spitting on his mic with my new podcast is all about. So receive it or be gone. And that's it, y'all. Done.